For minds as dreadfully mortal as ours so often are, it is common to attempt to codify the past through a framework of events, major occurrences at pivotal moments, scaffolding for understanding. The Horus heresy is no exception, a period of history so cyclopean in its scale and tragedy as to oft defy comprehension. Battles will ever emerge as loci of historical discourse. Prospero, Kalth, Molech, Yarant, Beta Garmin, and Terra itself. Yet for each of these era-defining conflicts, there are a thousand others of, if not equal, importance to the ultimate fate of the war than of equal value to historical record. It is knowledge that can come with its own especial curse, the vast majority of the citizens of this great imperium of ours simply will never know that the heresy even occurred. Many others will know it as some great debacle of eons past, but only in the most shallow of terms. The select few, those of one's own Logos Historica Vertia, and the chroniclers past who labored to preserve knowledge upon sacred vellum, are damned either to record the name of every legionary, every auxiliary, every citizen who perished in the fires of Horus's ambition, or perhaps worse still, to discern those lost only by the absence of verifiable death, flash fire shadows upon the wall of history. The topic of this record is in so many ways a battle archetypal of the Age of Darkness, yet singular in so many others. Know then that this is a record of the vengeance of the shattered, of the reaping of that which had been so bloodily sown, a record of the fall of the World Eater's fortress world of Bode. Any discussions upon the events surrounding the assault on Bode must begin with its most pivotal figure, the grim personage of Autek Mor, Iron Father of the Morgul clan of the Tenth Legion Iron Hands. Mor was a warrior forged in the earliest years of the Legion's active service history, having been born upon and raised to the Legion upon Terra itself. History records that Mor earned field command of his division through the blood of its former lord, seeming to imply an honor duel for the leadership position. For acolytes shocked by such seeming barbarity, one must remind students that this chapter of history, the Unification Wars, did birth a great many paragons, but also an equal, if not greater, number of souls stained by the darkness of their war-torn world. The Tenth Legion, at this point in history becoming known as the Stormwalkers, had already developed a reputation for unyielding ferocity, and it appeared more was something of an exemplar of this character, in the Legion's early years, if one of a possibly altogether malevolent Mien. Ferris Manus, the Tenth Legion's Primarch, was the third of his brothers to be recovered by the Emperor, meaning his Legion had less opportunity than others to develop independently. This did not, however, prevent the dark figure of Autek Mor from being outcast following the union of Primarch and Legion. While Moore, of course, bent the knee to his gene sire, the Terran was recorded as having faced difficulties with the profound change to the Legion's doctrines Ferris Manus introduced, ultimately leading to his placement at the head of Clan Morogul. The clan formation was a refuge for those legionaries whose humors sat ill, unable to find balance becoming of warriors of other clans, yet whose use in battle was undeniable. Essentially, Clan Morgul formed the pariahs of the Tenth Legion. The rigidity of Manus's leadership was legendary, and those who could not fully conform to the strictures of his rule inevitably found their way to Autek Mor's command. Given this outcast status, 
It should come as no surprise that Clan Morgul were not amongst the Iron Hands that followed their Primarch into the teeth of the traitor's guns on Istvan V. The furious vanguard of Ferris Manus was led by the veteran Astartes of Clan Averniae, supplemented by other favored clans. Such indeed was the crushing pace of Ferris Manus' advance from the moment his fleet broke into the Istvan system, as well as the hurried deployment of the 18th Legion Salamanders and 19th Legion Raven Guard to attempt to keep up with the rampaging Gorgon, that when the full scale of the treachery unfolded, a significant portion of the Iron Hands remained in orbit as reserves, yet awaiting actual deployment. The outcasts of Clan Morgul had yet to even take their formation within the line of battle in orbit around the planet, and as the stunning treachery of the Iron Warriors, Word Bearers, Alpha Legion, and Night Lords was brought to fruition, they could only look upon it with helplessness. The Red Talon, Autek Moore's flagship, and its escorts emerged into a scene of utter bedlam, loyal Astartes ships burning in orbit or fending off swarms of traitor vessels, the open Vox networks filled with the howling curses of the betrayed. The Tenth Legion's own comms network was a nigh indiscernible mess, but through it all, one message could be read, repeated again and again, scarcely believable. Ferris Manus had fallen by the hand of none other than Fulgrim, Primarch of the Emperor's children. The Iron Hands had lost their father. One has catalogued the responses of the Tenth Legion to this unprecedented calamity in a previous record. For the purposes of this one, Ortec Moore accepted the news with a bitter, resigned finality. He immediately ordered the Red Talon's shipmaster to engage any targets of opportunity that presented themselves, but knew to his core that his ship could do next to naught to effect the unfolding massacre. The response was one born of furious, petulant revenge, and its recompense was scant. The Red Talon and its escorts inflicted negligible damage upon the traitors that swarmed to it, forcing Moore to order his flotilla and any other ships within range to disengage, making for the warp with their hulls punctured by dozens of traitor assault claws, and their corridors feeling the tread of traitor boarding parties. In the immediate aftermath of Istvan V's drop site massacre, those loyalists who had astonishingly survived lived lives defined by a choice, vengeance or survival. In time, a significant number of fleeing Iron Hands, Salamanders, and Raven Guard, those known historically as the Shattered Legions, would coalesce under the leadership of Shadrach Medusan, captain of the Iron Hands Clan Sorgal. Medusan advocated for an asymmetrical form of guerrilla warfare to be mounted against the traitors, engagements rooted in rapid attacks and even more rapid retreats, to bleed the foe by a thousand small cuts. This period in history was a pronounced sundering of the Iron Hands as an effective military entity in any coherent fashion. The Legion had effectively gone insane. While Medusan was a leader of one of the largest remaining 10th Legion remnants, he was far from universally respected. Ortec Moore, for instance, was one of his fiercest detractors. The Iron Father of Morogul utterly rejected Medusan's style of war-making, decrying it as being beneath the honor of the Iron Hands. Moore himself formulated strategies of his own. Morgul would rally what forces the Iron Hands and the Shattered Legions could muster to its banner, and specifically target worlds subjected recently to traitor invasion. This, Moore reasoned, would ensure the foe had spent as much of their strength as possible before coming under assault from his own armies. It was a brutal calculation. Loyal populations and their garrisons would suffer the full force of traitor onslaughts while Moore's iron hands would watch from afar, judging the precise moment to strike. It was a callous tactic, to be sure, but one that, to Ortec Moore's eyes, accounted for the grim practicalities of war as he saw them. Every Imperial civilian that took a traitor bolt round 
meant that there would be one less bolt round to kill one of his iron hands. Fragmented and scattered accounts from this period provide some glimpse into the path of Moore's Red Talon and the actions of his battle group immediately following Istvan V. One fully substantiated account, perhaps the most complete, records the Iron Hand's destruction of the traitor-held mining world of Saria Major. Denied orbital defenses and subject to Horus's resource extraction quotas by fear of reprisal alone, the world was easy prey for the Red Talon, which unleashed a macro-scale orbital bombardment of the planet's hive refineries, reducing many of them to molten slag and unleashing so much toxic material into the atmosphere as to condemn the survivors to a slow death on a hopelessly poisoned world. At the Battle of Locutar Station, Moore himself led a liberating strike against the besieging Sons of Horus, shattering the traitors just before their moment of victory and rescuing the entrenched loyalists within. The Red Talon's movements are harder to trace in other examples, given the sheer chaos of the conflicts involved. But credible evidence exists that points to Moore's ambushing of a Death Guard destroyer detachment in the Xenos ruins of Nasha's world, and to the hit-and-run operations upon traitor shipping lanes in the run-up to the Paramar invasion. One such convoy, seized as it transited into the outer reaches of the system's volume, was entirely destroyed or captured in twelve hours of void warfare. Many other worlds in the Galactic North fell utterly silent during this period of history, worlds known to have declared for the traitor cause of their own accord, and their extermination, thorough and punitive, was widely attributed to the actions of Autek Moore, becoming, as he had, a byword for cold vengeance behind traitor lines. Within a solar year, however, these traitor lines extended to cover much of the northern galactic volumes, encompassing what history has come to term the Warmaster's Dark Empire. What loyalist armies existed within these zones were either in complete disarray or bunkering within the most defensible sectors. Conditions within the warp were worsening with each passing week, making long-range transit effectively impossible and astro-telepathy extremely unreliable. Such conditions, of course, did not affect the traitor legions, who, through malevolent pacts and arcane rituals, were granted safe passage and clear communication. The advance of Horus's legions was inexorable, scattering those that stood before them, at worst inflicting annihilation, at best forcing a series of extremely costly withdrawal actions. It was in this context that, after a year of raiding, mustering, and ad hoc resupplying, Autek Moore, at the helm of the Red Talon, smashed into the traitor's rear lines like a lightning bolt. The diametric opposite of Shadrach Medusan's clinical and conflict-avoiding tactics, Moore's assault was one born of cold, bitter fury. While, as with the accounts prior to this, tracking the precise movement of the Red Talon is difficult, most chroniclers agree that the first step on Moore's bloody campaign was at Gethsemane Colonus in the Cyclops Cluster. The Talon, accompanied by a ragtag but extremely bellicose fleet, invaded the traitor-pledged Gethsemane to capture key traitor personnel, before mounting an immediate withdrawal and subjecting the world's population centers to a full-scale atomic bombardment that rendered the planet uninhabitable. This is perhaps the best illustration of the sheer disparity between the approaches of Shadrach Medusan and Ortek Mor during this time. Whereas the former would have been content with the capture of targets alone, reasoning that resources best not be spent upon punitive annihilation efforts, the latter held nothing but contempt for those that he saw as traitors, and bent every effort towards inflicting total extermination upon them. This was the opening salvo in Autek Moore's deeply personal crusade of vengeance. Hailed by some historitors as the last loyalist out of the Coronid Deeps, it is the opinion of your humblest of servants that Moore didn't even leave them in the first place. He simply weathered the storm that tore the volume apart before striking at the traitor Warmaster's rearguard. In all likelihood, 
He saved countless lives of loyalist Imperial citizens while doing so, even if he cared not one bit for this result. The planet Bode, located in the coreward reaches of Segmentum Ultima, had been brought into the Imperial Fold by the actions of the 13th Expeditionary Fleet, even renaming its capital Tredecimia in the fleet's honor. The world was granted, at its accession to the Imperium, to the 12th Legion, then known as the Warhounds, as a fife and recruitment ground. It, too, had the singular privilege of being the ground upon which the 12th Primarch Angron was granted command of his legion, now newly renamed as the World Eaters, at a ceremony that gathered the might of not only the entire legion, but its many auxiliary formations, such as the Numen Gun Clans and the Legio Audax of the Collegia Titanica. It was a gathering that a colleague of mine once termed the bloodiest and most brutal collection of war bands that the Imperium had ever gathered in one place. The Lord Angron and the 13th Expeditionary Fleet left behind them a world converted entirely to support their juggernaut of war. Imperial industry transformed the arid, volcanic planet into a military world factory, with barracks the size of cities atop subterranean ammunition dumps of equal size, bordering continent-spanning weapons testing and live training regions. Tredesimia itself became the locus of World Eater recruitment. Aspirants drawn from other Legion fiefs or recently conquered worlds were shipped there in their thousands to undergo Astartes Ascension Protocols and, ultimately, the implantation of the so-called Butcher's Nails, that crude but incredibly effective cybernetic brain implant modeled upon Angron's own, and the dark blessing of the Legion's legacy. The city consistently played host to a large segment of the Apothecarion from the Twelfth Legion, rotated in from active front lines to ply their bloody trade and bring new experience to the Legion's collective understandings. Additionally, the aforementioned auxiliary gun clans, allied Mechanicum Tagmata, notably those from Serum, also trained and equipped themselves on Bode, and the planet also served as the forward operating base for the Legio Audax's Scout Titans. It was, in fact, the Gun Clans that began, in the second century of the Great Crusade, to establish not only a permanent presence, but a stable and expanding population base on Bode, intermingling with the feral tribal bands of the planetary wastelands to form a hybrid culture ripe for 12th Legion cultivation. As more and more aspirants flowed from World Eater conquests across the galaxy, to the bio-factories of Tredesimia, the planetary population swelled to such a degree that it became practice for the gun clans of the Wastes to offer their strongest candidate for ritual combat against a legion inductees undergoing ascension procedures. These contests were inevitably live fire, wetted blade, and to the death. Only the strongest competitor would survive. If it were the aspirant, their path to legionary was nigh assured. If it was the gun clanner, the legion had saved itself valuable time and resources by whittling away a useless candidate, while simultaneously gaining a new one. It formed, in time, a culture of both animosity and codependency. While the legion essentially fought the clanners to the death, they did so to simply gain the best and most suitable candidates to join their ranks. By the close of the Great Crusade's second century, Bode was essentially unrecognizable from the world it had been before compliance. After a fashion mirroring the significant, disturbing changes the leadership of Angron had wrought on his legion. Always a world prone to tectonic and volcanic instability, the extremely reckless treatment of the legion's live-fire, macro-scale weapons testing had caused degeneration of the planetary crust such that not a day went by where its regions were not subjected to minor earthquakes, as the plates shifted restlessly. The seas were utterly poisoned by resource extraction operations and the aforementioned weapons testing, polluting further the already ash-choked atmosphere and rendering what passed for a viable biosphere irreparably destroyed. 
The environmental destruction had reduced the wastelander population to subsistence living, perched forever on the precipice of starvation or thirst, with the combat rituals presented by the Legion becoming the only means a baseline human had of escaping their circumstances. Beyond the perhaps worse fate of being press-ganged into Mechanicum labor divisions or Navis Imperialis rating teams. Tredesimia had been transformed from a city-scale mustering ground into a fortress, with an extensive network of ground defenses and surface-to-orbit weapon silos. Its ammunition dumps contained not only bolt shells, but some of the World Eater's most forbidden and potent armaments, exterminatus grade or above, including, it is believed, technology from the Dark Age, forbidden by Imperial Rift for use by any Legion, but rules that were cheerfully ignored by Angron. These latter technologies were tended to by the sinister Crimson Priesthood of the Forge World of Serum, a planet liberated from the Brotherhood of Ruin by Angron's Legion decades before. Closer by far to the Bloody Twelfth than they ever were to Mars, the bellicose tagmata of Serum delighted in the sheer freedom the Red Angel granted them in the technologies they could research and wield, with the Forge's Crimson Priests being an omnipresent sight not only on Bode, but also alongside the Legion in almost every expeditionary fleet they served in. Had Bode, and what was occurring there, been on course for a formal Imperial censure is a question difficult to answer. The Emperor granted phenomenal leeway to his offspring in how they were allowed to treat planets and volumes under their direct purview. One need only cast one's gaze at the raising of Olympia and the destruction of Nostramo, both quite before the outbreak of the heresy, to see the degree of lenience the Master of Mankind was capable of in the name of expediency. However, what is known is that subsequent to the Dropside Massacre, an event in and of itself the World Eaters stationed on Bode only learned of after the fact, a delegation of the Legion's apothecaries arrived in Tridesimia, accompanied by peers from the 3rd Legion Emperor's Children and 17th Legion Word Bearers. By what appeared to be explicit order of the Primarch, this detachment assumed immediate command and control of the Legion's aspirant intake program and facilities. The 12th Legion's recruitment practices had ever been subject to criticism from without, being on perhaps the most extreme end of Astartes' Legion spectrum in terms of sheer brutality and human cost. This, of course, was now moot in the wake of the Great Betrayal. With the assumption of command by this new Apothecarian Division, all previous restraints, such as they were, were entirely lifted. A new raw fuel was introduced to the process, by several verifiable accounts harvested ritualistically by the word-bearers from the Fallen, Loyal, and Traitor both upon the Black Sands of Istvan V, and later alchemically distilled by the fell genius of the Emperor's children, Chirurgians. The results... well, they were hideous indeed. It was upon Bode that the Eye of Autek Mor had fallen. Traitor prisoners, captured and tortured, had revealed intelligence about a significant increase in shipping in the warp corridors that linked the Forge of Sarum to the World Eater's Fife. The Iron Father of Clan Morrigold surmised that the planet was mustering some sort of force to mark its entry into the war in a major capacity, but that it was not ready to do so quite yet. Moore was confident in his capacity to strike at the planet. While this marked a significant escalation in his private war, as well as an overall shift in established tactics, his warband had been reinforced by the recent addition of Loyalists fleeing defeat in the Manichean War, including regiments of the Agathan Solar Auxilia and a detachment of Astartes from the 7th Legion Imperial Fists. The Iron Father knew that, as an Astartes Fife and Muster World, Bode would be a stockpile for significant Legion as Astartes arms and armament reserves, material that would either serve to restock his own supplies, but at the very least should be denied to the traitors. Any potential recruits for Angron's dogs would also serve his cause best when dead, and of the increased contact between the isolationist Serum, Moore's own attendant Mechanicum spoke in only the gravest theories. 
It is perhaps likely that the true intent of Autek Moore is concealed somewhere within these conversations, musings between the Iron Father and tech priests of the most shadowed of Mechanicum Tagmata clades. But had he or the priests suspected anything about the procedures being developed in Astarte's ascension processes upon the Dark World, those suspicions would be proven quite correct. An interesting issue emerges in attempting to confirm the precise timing of Moore's attack on Bode, one born of the sheer chaos of this chapter in the Heresy. As previously discussed, astrotelepathic communication and long-distance warp travel had been rendered extremely unreliable by the prevailing immaterial conditions of the day. That being said, it is verifiable that the Divisio Militaris and the Office of the Sigilite were not only aware of Autec Moore's battle group, but were in highly sporadic contact with the Iron Father. The situation in the border regions between Imperial-held space and the Warmaster's Dark Empire was in a state of significant flux. Front lines were collapsing and shifting constantly, and the Council of Terra had extremely poor intelligence surrounding the greater picture. What passed for a centralized Imperial command in the volume had advocated for a full withdrawal to, and establishment of, a front line strung between Paramar and Chondax. It appears that at least one commander communicated this to Autic Moore aboard the Red Talon, but that the communication was simply not responded to. The order for Moore to link up with established Imperial forces was issued and was ignored. Had the commander that issued it known anything of the Iron Father's character, this may not have come as quite the surprise it no doubt did. It is said that Autec Moore was occasionally to disobey the word of his own Primarch. No doubt, the supposed authority of any other sat ill with him even before he had committed himself and his brothers of Clan Morrigul to this deeply personal war with Horus and the Traitor Legions. Whatever the outcome of this attempted communication, long-range Auspex screeds log the Red Talon and its fleet as having departed Iod Binary and making a 12-day transit to the Bode system, translating into real space in full battle order, spoiling for a fight with the bloodiest legion once sworn to the Imperium. Given the means by which Autec Mor waged his war against the forces of the Warmaster, and his seeming disdain for any Loyalist armies not directly acceding to this personal authority, it should come as little surprise that such disdain was extended to accurate minute-keeping of strategic planning. We do not, and likely never will, have a precise record of the planning of the assault on Bode. Accounts of the attack are drawn from a wide array of sources, with no single one to be considered authoritative. As with so many of the relatively smaller conflicts during the Age of Darkness, the account that shall follow is pieced together from everything from eyewitness accounts, necrocortical interrogations, auspex screeds, helm vid captures, and sundry other sources besides, filtered through the lens of chroniclers past. They are fragmentary at best and contradictory at worst. To add to matters, given the sheer insanity of Moore's opening gambit, the minds of many who were to witness it were invariably broken in some way, shape, or form. Sifting through all that has remained, kernels of what must be considered truth have emerged, and it is by these that one navigates the following account. The first act of the assault on Bode was both incredibly practical and deeply symbolic. The moon of Bode was an astral body clamped into a highly elliptical orbit, and was, by either chance or forward planning on the part of the Iron Hands, close to its orbital perigree, the nearest point of the orbit that took it as close as possible to the planet itself. As the Red Talon and its fleet burned in system, Autec Moore ordered the unleashing of his flagship's remaining high-yield ordnance. The unbelievable release of energy was visible from the planet's surface, a halo of fire surrounding the moon. The sight 
of it, transformed into a burning sphere, was recorded as having driven many a feral gun clan into an atavistic terror, rising in maddened fury as Shaman interpreted the omen as one of extreme ill, falling upon each other, or rival clans, in a hurricane of violence. Records speak to instances where clanners drew sacred armaments from clan stockpiles, holy devices loaded with their most precious ammunition, only to unleash it skywards at the moon itself. Because, to their eyes, the burning satellite was only getting bigger. Whatever about the provocation of insanity and chaos upon the surface, the true purpose of bombarding the moon was altogether more apocalyptic. Such was the energy unleashed by the Red Talon's bombardment that Bode's moon had been nudged ever so slightly out of its orbital path, and was now hopelessly, inexorably, trapped in a decaying path that would bring it crashing into the planet's surface. Autek Moore had transformed the satellite into a weapon of truly unspeakable destructive potential. Preceding the planetary impact of this moon-sized bullet, however, were munitions altogether mundane, but with, of course, their own power. A precision orbital bombardment was unleashed by the rest of Moore's fleet, which had split into a dozen separate assault squadrons. Each formation targeted a separate set of surface-to-orbit defense batteries. Swathes of Tredesimia were consumed in roiling seas of plasma, pounded by the fury of Loyalist ships into dust within the space of a single hour. Recompense was loosed skyward, of course, wounding several vessels, but such was the speed of the Loyalist assault, and, it must be said, the rather haphazard means by which the Twelfth Legion coordinated its defenses, that Tredesimia lay open to assault before too long. While weapon systems had been scoured clear, however, the real defenders of Bode had remained protected. Garrisons of World Eaters, shielded by voids, in subterranean bunkers, alongside the mortal auxiliaries that had been lucky enough not to be manning cannon batteries. These could, of course, only be dislodged by a mass planetary landing. As the burning moon waxed larger in the skies, the world was transformed by its new light. The fires of a tortured atmospheric entry now lit it, bathing the planet's ostensible night-sized in a chthonic orange glow. As the maddened defenders of Tredesimia cast their eyes skyward, the dying moon appeared now accompanied by other, smaller objects. Legionnaires Astartes gunships and drop pods making full re-entry burn towards the capital's starport. What ground defenses remained opened fire in anemic rage. There was no hope the World Eaters' facilities could ward off such an assault. But the sons of Angron cared little so long as the blood of their attackers could be spilled. As gunships and drop pods slammed into the rusty wasteland surrounding Tredesimia, the guns of the capital reaped an oft-horrific toll. But these Astartes were veterans of Istvan V. Such firepower, even the kills it tallied, was next to nothing for them. The Iron Hands waded from their insertion points with a cold, methodical fury, heedless of any losses. Within four hours, they had successfully broken out of the hasty cordons that ringed each of their chosen drop zones. Simultaneously, Wings of Xiphon strike fighters, covered by the boiling miasma of flash-fired ocean water, shrieked across the poisonous seas around the capital to attack the primary defense bastion. Coming in low enough that the fortress's shield bubble was of no use, the interceptors withheld no ammunition in their attacks. As much firepower as could be unleashed was unleashed. The attack wings toppled the bastion into the poisoned, boiling sea causing a tsunami to hit all coasts that ringed it. The primary defense citadel neutralized, Autech Moore's airborne assault turned its attention to the mountaintop defense line, identified as what passed for a command and control hub for the 12th Legion. 
The attacking craft, plunging back down from hurried orbital rearmament, pounded the line with a deluge of bomb munitions, before speeding out of the combat zone to make way for two full Thunderhawk gunship insertion wings. One led by the Iron Hands, the other by their allied Imperial Fists. With each wing targeting one end of the line, the assault force would pincer the entrance to the subterranean command bunker that lay in its middle. The attack took over an hour, ultimately seeing the fists breach the blast doors to the bunker and driving furiously into its interior, hungry for the glory of this honorable kill and for revenge against the traitors. The decapitation strike opened the way for the final phase of the assault, now unfolding in the south of the city. Tredesimia's starport, along with several Mechanicum facilities to its east, came under intense drop pod assault by the remaining Iron Hands. In response, the largest force of World Eaters yet deployed engaged the 10th Legion in a furious counterattack. Recovered helm logs and vid captures have allowed Imperial Historators to catalog this as being among the first recorded instances of combat encounters with traitor Astartes who had undergone unsanctioned implantation and ascension protocols. Never a legion given to what many would deem an excess of tactical sense, the World Eaters of Bode fought with a ferocity hitherto unseen in all but the bloodiest of their great crusade-era engagements. They heeded not only their own combat losses, but personal injuries besides. Devolving into bitter hand-to-hand -hand combat, the day was carried by the Loyalists, thanks to the arrival of Imperial Fist reinforcements on their western flank, the Seventh Legion's deployment pinning the traitors in place and winnowing their numbers as the World Eaters howled their rage into Bode's choked atmosphere. The Mechanicum facilities were subjected to a cordon by Moore's allied 1522nd Solar Auxilia detachments. Of all available intelligence upon the forces of Bode, those surrounding Serum's Mechanicum Tagmata were the most occluded, their unknown manufactoria and laboratoria potentially playing host to any number of wicked devices. As such, the Solar Auxilia held nothing in orbit, setting down their super-heavy armor divisions, spearheaded by Baneblade and Stormhammer tanks. Well, indeed, was it they had, for as the armor hove into their assigned positions, a proverbial tide of automata burst from concealed bunkers amid the Mechanicum zone. While some were clearly of sanctioned construct types, such as the Castellax and Vorax automata, many Many others were of malevolently unfamiliar visages and capabilities. The next hour saw the Solar Auxilia engaged in severely costly holding actions against the robotic horde, selling their lives against nightmare creations whose legacies would become horribly familiar to any who fought the so-called true Mechanicum in the years, and indeed millennia, to come. Wicked combat claws tore through flesh and armor with apparent ease, while scampering piston-driven monstrosities powered over the wastes on uncannily articulated legs. Arachnid form combat walkers overwhelmed tanks, flipping them like playthings or shearing into their plates. Even when engaged at a distance, a form of warpcraft shielding mounted upon many of these devices proved adept at turning aside shot and shell, similar in aspect to the shielding around Astartes' contemptor dreadnoughts. The Auxilia, despite this, held, and did so admirably, their defenses successfully cordoning in the automata and preventing engagement with the Legionnaires' Astartes beyond. The Iron Hands and the Imperial Fists had found their momentum had begun to bleed away, Wherever their squads pressed an assault, fresh waves of defenders appeared to immediately counterattack. Drawn to conflict as always, crazed gun clanners, maddened by the fiery moon descending upon them, fell now upon the invaders. While, of course, the scavenger tribes could not match Astartes in capabilities, 
their sheer quantity and suicidal insanity bogged down many of Moore's attackers, several of whom resorted to simply pulverizing the baseline human wretches with their bare fists in efforts to preserve ammunition supplies for legionary opponents. Still, the assault pressed forward, inch by bloody, corpse-strewn inch. In the northwest sector of the city, the macro provender silos, heavily defended, were now targeted by the invaders in what retrospect has revealed to be the true intent of Autech Moore that had driven him to assault Bode in the first place. It was now the fifth hour of fighting, and a pivotal moment for the invaders. The Legio Audax Titan Maniples, rumored to be headquartered near the silos, had yet to be detected. Multiple Warhound Scout Titans could pose a risk to any assault force, compelling Moore to deploy several divisions of blocking forces to react to Audax's potential entry into the fighting. One such force, Iron Hands Astartes mounted in Mastodon assault transports, supported by Mauler battle tanks, was set down to the east of the silos, while two more, another Iron Hands force and a third from the Imperial Fists, were deployed to the north. The eastern force was immediately beset by World Eaters tasked with defending the silos, who abandoned their static defense lines and objective points entirely to charge the invading Iron Hands. The forces to the north reported only light resistance from isolated and uncoordinated auxiliaries. Moore had clearly bet his next move on the 12th Legion abandoning their own lines. He himself took to the field at the vanguard of a Gorgon Terminator assault force. The technology of these suits, rare even before the outbreak of the war, have been maintained and even iterated upon in exile by Autech Moore himself, and he committed to his teleport assault from orbit every single one at his disposal, manned by Clan Morrigal's most lauded veterans. The black iron wave bore down on the western defenders of the silos like a hammer upon an already shattered anvil. Autech Moore and his terminators swept aside the sparse defenders and slaved Mechanicum gun turrets like chaff before a scythe. It was only as the assault force breached the chambers below the silos that the first of their number was to perish. Machine sentries, devised by the cunning of the Red Priests of Serum, detached themselves from secreted compartments within the macro machinery of the silos, emerging insectoid-like and falling upon the Iron Hands with lightning guns and irad cleansers. In response, the Gorgons increased their weight of fire, advancing steadily, burning through ammunition reserves as it appeared every crevice held within it some new, twisted mechanical horror. Their implacable advance bore them to blast doors designed to withstand heavy ordnance, yet which fared poorly against the chain fists of the Terminators. More. Apparently on the cusp of whatever he had come for, reportedly forbade any of his warriors from following him past this point, ordering them to hold the door at all costs as he descended into the Stygian depths beyond. This the Gorgons of Moragul did without question. Across the wastes above, the forces of the invaders were being pressed at all points by the World Eaters and their allies wave upon wave of legion inductii, all at varying stages of their Astartes' ascension, were herded forth into the guns of the Loyalists, casting aside every scrap of their training save for the close-quarter savagery they had learned in the gladiatorial pits. Strength and ferocity bore them forward, and despite the high death toll amongst them, the cost in Loyalist lives to put them down was growing more and more severe. In Tredesimia's north, the Iron Hands were attacked by the first recorded appearance of World Eater's Red Butchers, Terminator-armored berserks so broken in mind they were forced to be chained in place when not in combat, lest they fall upon their own supposed battle brothers. 
deployed in a mass phalanx, the crude but effective wedge of bloody ruin carved into the Iron Hands, threatening for a time to push them from their landing zones entirely. The assault was only curtailed after the hurried deployment of heavy Mastodon transports, their cyclonic melta lances scouring the field of mad Terminator squads in cascades of searing destruction. The true tragedy of these staggering losses was only revealed in the aftermath. The Red Butchers deployed on Bode were not, in fact, traitors, but rather loyalists, recovered from the ashes of Istvan III, they who had fought Horus and their betraying brethren to the point that their minds were simply broken. Their perfidious legion had seen fit to imprison them within Terminator suits and use them as living weapons. The sixth hour of the invasion is marked by an overall degradation in the quality of available accounts and evidence, likely due to an increase in the general insanity of the fighting. As the burning moon drew ever closer, the gun clans were driven into greater and greater feats of lunatic destruction, convinced, and not entirely without cause, that their world was ending. Their savagery was nothing, however, next to the World Eaters. Each fresh wave of inductii released from their billets against the loyalist Astartes was more and more ferocious. It appeared for all the world that the World Eaters were resorting to simply unleashing the least stable of their aspirants upon the invaders. Recalling in some cases the psychopathic bloodthirst of the more lurid descriptions of ancient Thunder Warriors, the World Eater inductii were less deployed and more herded, beasts in the shape of men cascading into loyalist lines with no hint of coordination or strategy. Legion officers of sounder mind may have ultimately been in command, but the 12th Legion that took to the field on Bode was, if anything, one that presaged the fate of the World Eaters in the long dark years to come. A horde of uncontrollable butchers simply released for the slaughter. Some even bore esoteric weaponry, a lot of it clearly unstable, and clearly still wrought by the sinister hand of the Crimson Magi. The invaders were forced to adapt their tactics as best they could, deploying overwhelming firepower upon any collected group of traitors that made themselves visible. The better, they reasoned to annihilate the foe before they could close the distance. The fate of the planetary assault was now in question, hanging in the balance. Whatever it was Moore was seeking in the depths below the city, he was taking too long to obtain it. It was placing the fate of his entire invasion force at risk of doom, as the world burned and the moon hove closer, the tortured skies wreathing the coming apocalypse in fire and brimstone. The arrival of a dozen Warhound Scout Titans of the Legio Audax firmly swung the favor against the Loyalists. The formation charged in from a maneuver operation far to the north of the city that had previously been occupying them. Vulcan megabolters tore into combat melees, the princeps of the Legio heedless of whether they killed friend or foe, the value of Legio inductii lives versus Loyalist kills clearly having been communicated to them by the grand ease of the World Eater's planetary command. As the Gorgon Terminators and the Macro Silos prepared now to weather the assault of God Engine class machines, Autech Moore finally re-emerged. Per Iron Hand accounts, his eyes were said to have been alight with dark fire, and his armor scored as if he had killed a thousand savage foes. By all accounts, the malevolence of his visage appeared even more severe than when he had vanished from sight. Bearing still his weapons, his ritual servo arm grasped within it a single stasis casket. Recovered picked captures, scried over by approved tech priests, have revealed the flanks of this casket to have been stamped with seals identical to those used by the Emperor's own gene rites and the servants of Amar Astarte when she worked 
with the Master of Mankind upon the Primarch project, to develop the Legionnaires Astartes, after which she was honored. Moore spoke a single word, and it heralded a full-scale retreat into orbit. The Iron Father had clearly obtained what he had come for, and assessed that there was no further worth in engaging the enemy at hand. Storm Eagles and Thunderhawks tore in from orbit, alighting at prearranged landing zones to exfiltrate the survivors of the assault waves, as Fire Raptor gunships circled above and punished any traitor that tried to harry the retreating loyalists. The Solar Auxilia mounted a similarly spirited retreat, forced to abandon their heaviest surviving battle tanks, but managing to mount a withdrawal that saved the majority of their fighting force. bereft now of any foes, save for isolated loyalist squads that were selling their lives dearly in sacrifice, the traitor horde simply fell upon itself. Gun clanners and Legion inductii, maddened by bloodlust, tore into each other with gun and sword, fist and blade, howling, screeching, dying in wanton abandon, as the heat of the falling moon now began to render the air itself unbreathable. First cloth began to spontaneously combust, then human hair. But all the while, the killing reached greater and greater heights. The Legion and its fife locked together in a bloody, impossibly cruel terminal embrace. In orbit, thousands of loyalists cast their view to the diminishing planet to watch the moon's final impact. The scale is simply impossible to capture into words. A bow wave of boiling rock flooded outwards from the impact point, beginning to encircle the entire planet. The crust itself visibly buckled, distorting under the colossal forces unleashed by such an impact. Bode, as the larger planetary mass appeared to effectively swallow its former satellite. The atmosphere caught fire in an expanding circle, followed by volcanic eruptions as the tortured tectonic plates split along seams, desperate to drive the mantle, now newly swollen by the moon's mass, anywhere it could. Nothing survived. Nothing could. Not a single inch of bowed surface was spared from the apocalypse unleashed by the moonfall. Every single world eater, tech priest, lowly menial, or gun clanner yet living on the world simply died. The account of the assault on Bode, that one has related, is the subject of a not insignificant amount of debate since its first collation by chroniclers laboring in the aftermath of the heresy's fires. Details are frequently argued back and forth, but one has labored as best one can, in one's role as your humblest of servants, to include only those either verifiable or with significant surrounding evidence to back up their supposition. Bode, to this day, is a world uninhabitable. Adeptus Mechanicus adepts, permitted to engage in studies of worlds deemed Traitorus Perdicia, estimate that its tectonic stabilization will not occur for many more millennia, if ever. The world, already unstable, may be simply doomed to disintegrate into an asteroid field, murdered 10,000 years ago by a bullet the size of a moon. This was, of course, clearly the intent of Autech Moore. But his more occluded intentions still draw supposition. Why was the Iron Father willing to risk the lives of some 6,000 Astartes and 12,000 Solar Auxilia in a ground invasion if the world's fate had already been sealed? The only possible answer lies in the nature of the device Autech Moore recovered from beneath the macro silos, around which only mystery lies. Much has been made of the scattered 
and terrible evidence that the Iron Hands, variously maddened by the death of their Primarch, engaged in technological and genetic modification practices that were far beyond the boundaries of not only what the Emperor had prescribed, but what basic sanity allowed for. The unsealing of the keys of hell, the use of Chimerica, deployment of Revenant Astartes. These accounts and more speak to a legion driven beyond desperation into something else entirely. Suspected by many to have contained a myriad of horrors born of old night, the vaults of the Red Priests of Serum upon Bode would have been tempting targets for any Astartes shorn of whatever ethics they had originally possessed. And for one with the cold, unrelenting mind of Altec Moor, a priceless prize indeed. The presence of ancient Terran gene rite symbols upon the stasis casket only deepens the mystery, especially when one considers the frantic and scattershot genetic hothousing that was already being experimented upon on Bode by the Twelfth Legion's apothecaries. Perhaps through the device recovered, Autek Moore sought to transform the survivors of Clan Morgul and any other willing brethren from the Shattered Legions into something beyond even their Astartes potential. Yet as to whether the Iron Father accomplished this, current evidence devolves into mere speculation of the most lurid variety, which one is professionally unwilling to commit to in this particular record. It is, however, verifiable that Autec Moore's legacy lives on to this present day. The Red Talons chapter of the Adeptus Astartes owe their lineage to the Iron Hands Legion and their name to Moore's flagship. It is generally believed the Iron Father survived the heresy to lead the chapter in its formation during the Second Founding, where it developed its storied reputation for a cold, furious pursuit and prosecution of fleeing traitor legion forces. Even in the present era Indomitus, the newly swollen ranks of the Red Talons relentlessly pursue the archenemy. For them, the myths of their founder still hold great power. Like he who bore them into being, they too will put worlds to fire, such that a single enemy may be killed. Ave Imperator. Gloria in excelsis terra. This video and this channel were made possible thanks to the very kind donations and support from my Patreon subscribers. If you'd like to help support the channel, head on over to patreon.com slash Oculus Imperia. If you'd like to receive more updates about the channel and any future videos, you can contact me or follow me on Twitter at Oculus Imperia. Otherwise, please like, subscribe, comment, let me know your feedback, and as ever, thank you very much for watching.